The Civil Rights Movement is one of the most important movements in American history. While the movement primarily occurred in the 1950s and 1960s, we're going to look at the background and the need for the Civil Rights Movement, including early efforts and early civil rights leaders leading up to the primary movement. Ultimately, the movement was about ending racial discrimination and racial segregation and also securing voting rights and an end to racial violence against African Americans. The real triumph of the movement takes place in the early 1960s with the securing of the Civil Rights Act and also the Voting Rights Act. Let's first look at some of the background to the Civil Rights Movement before we actually get into its main events and leaders in the 1950s and 1960s. We can identify several key causes of the Civil Rights Movement. One is a history of racial discrimination in the United States. Much of this discrimination occurred in the Southern United States before and during the Civil War and particularly after the Civil War. But really, discrimination against African Americans could occur in many places across the country and at different levels regarding housing and public access to uh, stores and also schools and also an equal way of life to white Americans. Another important cause of the Civil Rights Movement was the segregated South, what's often called the Jim Crow South, in which really there are two cultures, two ways of life, two different groups of people living two different lives in some ways in the South, with segregated lunch counters and segregated schools, segregated water fountains, segregated bathrooms between blacks and whites. The strong racial demarcation in the South is going to be one of the primary targets of the modern civil rights movement. There's also, of course, a long history of racial violence directed against African Americans, which could include sexual assault against African American women or physical violence against African American men or even murder. Part of the civil rights movement will particularly be focused on ending that type of indiscriminate justified violence against African Americans. And then finally, voting disenfranchisement of African Americans. For much of the American South, African Americans were denied the right to vote through a series of poll taxes or literacy tests or even the threat of violence preventing blacks from re uh, registering to vote in the first place and then exercising their constitutional right to vote secured by the United States Constitution after the Civil War. In many ways, the modern civil rights movement was a continuation or perhaps a finishing of the work that was commenced during the Reconstruction period. After the Civil War, the United States Congress passed and ratified three important amendments to the United States Constitution, sometimes called the Reconstruction Amendments. The first one, of course, being the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States. Now, involuntary servitude could still occur for those who had been convicted of a crime, but involuntary servitude or slavery was made illegal by the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment defined citizens of the United States as all those who had been born in the United States or had gone through a process of naturalization. And therefore, anyone who is a citizen could not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. None, none of these people who were citizens of the United States could be denied the equal protection of the laws. That clause in the 14th Amendment is sometimes called the Equal Protection Clause. And it was going to be a key, it would be a key provision in the Civil Rights Movement calling upon Congress and states to defend the rights of African Americans on the basis of the Equal Protection Clause, that African Americans are entitled to equal protection under the law, just as white people and every other citizen of the nation. And then the 15th Amendment was supposed to secure the right to vote of all citizens of the United States, regardless of race, color, or former condition of servitude. Thus, white Americans who are already voting, white male Americans that is, would be joined by African-American male voters with the passage of the 15th Amendment. 
Now, these were the amendments that were ratified by the Congress and added to the Constitution after the Civil War, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all of them went into effect, and certainly a lot of them were not a reality, particularly in the southern parts of the United States. In fact, some ugly realities for African Americans living in the South become commonplace even after the abolition of slavery with the 13th Amendment. One of these, and one of the most violent and abhorrent, of course, was the process, uh, the practice of lynching, in which African American males or females could be targeted by white crowds or local clansmen, white citizens' councils, and accused of a crime, or perhaps justice being taken into the hands of the mob, in which a black man could be taken out of the local town and then hanged from a local tree. This, process of, this practice of lynching occurs frequently in Reconstruction South and then well into the 20th century and will draw a lot of the attention of the civil rights leaders. Another ugly practice that was directed against African Americans, particularly in the southern United States, was the process of convict leasing. Convict leasing, in many ways, was slavery by another name. African Americans who struggled to find employment in southern states after the Civil War could be accused of very minor crimes, including loitering or hanging around uh, and not having a job, and then they could be sentenced to with severe penalties, even prison terms, and often they could also have their time, their labor, their freedom sold out to the highest bidder. And therefore, the state may be making money off of these African-American prisoners, and so would private contractors. But of course, the convict themselves, who had either been falsely accused or certainly harshly punished for a minor offense, is having to provide labor uh, at no profit to themselves. So therefore, in many ways, it was a form of slavery by another name. It's a common practice in the southern United States well into the 20th century. Indeed, after the passage of the Reconstruction Amendment, Southern states very quickly move in their state legislatures to pass what are called black codes. These are state laws that disenfranchise blacks from voting in Southern states and also deny them equal protection under the law, often justifying violence against them and certainly not giving them equal access to public facilities. Blacks were prohibited from assembling together or voting. Uh, in several southern states, they are prohibited from handling weapons or serving on a jury. Many states pass anti-miscegenation laws in which a uh, black man was not allowed to have sexual relations or to marry a white woman. And unemployed and vagrant blacks could be arrested and assigned for convict leasing. And some southern states actually also pass laws prohibiting or preventing black land ownership. So despite the fact that blacks had been emancipated from slavery with the 13th Amendment, in many ways they are living in a very uh, oppressive system and denied many of li the liberties that other white Americans enjoyed. Congress does pass two civil rights acts, the first in the history of the country, in the Reconstruction period, in an effort to improve the condition of blacks and give them more access to civil rights in the South, but generally these are not enforced. And once Northern troops withdraw from the South in 1877, generally they are not enforced and Blacks live in a series of, uh, in a, a state of oppression throughout much of the Southern United States. Indeed, starting with the Reconstruction period well into the 20th century, we often refer to this time period as the Jim Crow South. This expression has a um, confusing or difficult to discern origin, but it seems to be based on a song that featured a caricature of an African-American dancing male that was called Jump Jim Crow. And so it becomes a euphemism or a tagline to describe the culture of segregation and discrimination that characterized the South. This Jim Crow South often saw separate waiting rooms at train stations, separate bathrooms for black and white customers, 
It often saw separate black and white water fountains, and it particularly and most egregiously, it saw separate black and white schools in the South. Often the white schools, of course, were well-funded with well-trained teachers and the most up-to-date textbooks and the best teaching supplies, and the local black school where black children were required to attend was often in a dilapidated building with poorly trained teachers, uh, not properly heated in the winter or cooled in the summer, and therefore blacks in the South, black children grow up in rather oppressive environments, particularly regarding their education. An important piece of legislation is signed into law by President Ulysses S. Grant in 1871, Entitled, often called the Ku Klux Klan Act. Realizing that there was a growing amount of violence in Reconstructed South, particularly directed against African Americans, President Grant endeavors to use the power of the federal government to curb violence against blacks. By the Ku Klux Klan Act, the president was empowered to suppress state disorders and granted the power to suspend habeas corpus. So in other words, the president would be able to step in if he knew that there was systematic violence directed, particularly by Klansmen, against African Americans, those individuals could be arrested and held for a longer period of time before charges could be developed and then levied against those perpetrators. The most significant Supreme Court case directed against the plight of African Americans in the 19th century is probably Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. It is in this case that the United States Supreme Court delivers the famous three words that are going to become the defining experience for African Americans, particularly in the South, separate but equal. Now, the case that was brought before the Supreme Court involved railway companies who were carrying passengers on their trains and segregating the races according to black and white. In other words, on the train cars, there would be separate accommodations for blacks and separate accommodations for whites. And of course, the accommodations for blacks were often inferior to those that were provided and sold to white customers. This case is brought before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules in favor of the railway companies that they can continue that practice of segregated accommodations for black and white customers on the trains. However, the decision of Plessy v. Ferguson is interpreted and applied much more broadly than actually the court had stated or had intended, and indeed the most famous arena in which Plessy v. Ferguson is applied is in the area of education, in the area of schools. And so that slogan, those three words of separate but equal, get applied to education, particularly in the South, which leads to almost a century of black and white schools in the South with, of course, black schools often being very inferior to the local white schools, particularly in the South. Now, there are early calls for a measure of racial equality, particularly among some progressive reformers. Ray Standard Baker publishes his famous work in 1908, Following the Color Line, an Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy, and he actually introduces or promotes the idea of racial equality, that not only should African Americans not be the target of white violence, but also they should live in harmony and live in equality with whites. It was a rather extraordinary and revolutionary idea, even at the turn of the century. Another significant work by another significant progressive reformer and writer was by Ida B. Wells. Ida Wells was very intent on bringing attention to the horrific practice of lynching in the South, and therefore she does a copious amount of research and details the events in many of these lynch cases and often proves that African American males particularly were falsely accused or accused with very suspicious evidence or a lack of evidence and then taken outside of the town and lynched by a local mob of Klansmen or White Citizens Council members. Her work, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All of Its Phases, attracted national attention for the first time to the practice of lynching in the South, although it would be decades before the process is really discontinued. 
unquestionably probably the most significant civil rights leader for African Americans right about the turn of the 20th century was Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington had an extraordinary biography, and he used the story of his own life to fuel his work to also garner white support for his efforts to prove, improve the plight of African Americans in the United States. Booker T. Washington was born as a slave. He was born about the year of 1856, and of course he would not uh, experience emancipation until during the Civil War and then certified by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Later on, he is going to write his very significant transformative biography entitled Up From Slavery, an autobiography published in 1901. In it, Booker T. Washington tells his story about being into, born into slavery and his experience as a young boy, remembering his slave life, and then having absolutely nothing, living in abject poverty once his emancipation had been secured. But as you read along in Booker T. Washington's story, he talks about the importance of hard work and the importance of how hard he had worked to secure his own education. And once he had secured his own education, he was intent to making sure that other blacks, particularly Southern blacks, were able to have the same access to, ed to education and economic opportunities. And so therefore, he is the founder of Tuskegee University. This is one of the first significant uh, black training and technical schools in the South. And it really res, uh, reflects Booker T. Washington's emphasis on education. Washington really believes that if blacks would work hard and get educated, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that they would be able to advance in life. They don't need to focus on racial discrimination or be concerned so much about segregation. Those things would take care of themselves. Violence directed against blacks would take care of themselves. But rather, blacks themselves need to have self-respect and earn the respect of whites in the South, and that will eventually change their plight and change their condition. In fact, Booker T. Washington delivers a famous speech at the Atlanta Exposition that often gets called the Atlanta Compromise in 1895. In the speech, Booker T. Washington essentially proposes a compromise with white authorities in the South. He offers the compromise and promises that Southern blacks would work hard and would submit to white political rule, that they would not issue staunch demands to end racial segregation, and they would not demand immediate racial equality. In return, Booker T. Washington was asking that Southern whites would promise to grant basic educational opportunities and the due process of law to Southern blacks and that a greater portion of the state budget would be directed to fund black educational charities. Now this too reflects Booker T. Washington's belief that if just blacks will work hard and get educated, their condition in life will improve. Many Southern whites give tepid acknowledgement to this compromise, but still it does not stem the violence that often characterizes the African American experience in the South. And therefore, it galvanizes other leaders, particularly northern civil rights leaders, to demand more and require more from southern political leaders. That was certainly the case with the black intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois was the first African American to graduate with his Ph.D. from Harvard University. He, too, is very well educated but he's certainly more radical and demands more immediate solutions to America's racial problems than Booker T. Washington did. Indeed, he took great issue and opposed significantly Booker T. Washington's ideas. W.B. B. Du Bois puts forth his ideas in his work, The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903. In The Souls of Black Folk, W.B. Du Bois really tries to highlight the African-American experience and the systemic race, racial violence and segregation and discrimination that characterizes their lives and demands an immediate end, demands immediate civil rights, demands that state legislatures immediately provide the right to vote for blacks.
He says that African Americans are tired of waiting for racial justice. They demand racial justice immediately, and they are not looking to compromise or work with Southern political leaders. W.E.B. Du Bois is influential in the development of what becomes known as the Niagara Movement, in which various black civil rights leaders came together to advocate for the rights of African Americans across the country. Eventually, the Niagara Movement will morph into what becomes the NAACP, which is the acronym that stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Still today, the NAACP serves as one of the most important legal institutions advocating for African American rights and also advocating for educational and economic opportunities and uh, assists uh, poor blacks with their defense if they've been victims of racial discrimination or racial violence. W.E.B. E. Du Bois' vision for African Americans was centered on what he called the Talented Tenth. Du Bois did affirm the importance of education, and he believed that a tenth of the African American population could be trained effectively, educated properly, and trained as activists and as community leaders that they could enter the political realm and then they could use the political apparatus to affect change for African Americans. Indeed, the early 20th century sees a continual discrimination and prevalence of violence directed against African Americans, again, particularly in Southern states, but not exclusively. Many African Americans had been conscripted into the army during World War I and had served overseas gallantly and heroically. Often they were in segregated units. They were better accepted by French officers than by their own American officers. And for many Amer African Americans, they believed as they had fought for liberty, freedom, and democracy abroad, that once they came back to the United States, those promises would be finally secured to them. When they are not, and African American veterans are forced to return to their poor schools and to a lack of economic opportunities, racial violence often breaks out in America's cities, not just in the South, but also in Chicago and in Boston and in Philadelphia and in Baltimore. Indeed, the summer in 1919 is sometimes called the Red Summer because of racial conflict between returning African-American veterans and local white authorities. Another important early civil rights leader was A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph has the distinction of organizing the first African-American labor union, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. There were many African-Americans who served as porters, that is chefs and essentially chambermaids, on trains and luxury sleeper cars across the country. And realizing that they were such a significant economic force, particularly for the rail industry, A. Philip Randolph organizes them into a labor union that indeed exercised a political power that far exceeded its early numbers. Indeed, A. Philip Randolph is going to be instrumental in lobbying uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt to ban discrimination in defense industries during World War II and would also pressure President Harry S. Truman to issue an executive order ending segregation in the armed services. Later on in 1963, A. Philip Randolph will be one of the primary organizers on the March on Washington in 1963. If you were to visit a train station or a bus terminal beginning in the 1920s, but continuing into the 1930s, 1940s, and even 1950s, there's a good chance that you would see a number of African-American males and families in the bus terminal or train station moving to points north. This is often called the Great Migration, in which many African-American residents of the South grow tired of the segregation, discrimination, and violence of the South and begin to move north. Indeed, 4.1 million African-Americans move from the South to the North in just the years 1910 to 1930. This is when a lot of northern cities particularly are augmented with their black populations that they uh, have today. So for many blacks who are leaving the South, they go to cities like Chicago, Detroit, Columbus, 
Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, and even points as far west as Oakland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. As a result of the Great Migration that happens over several decades into the early 20th century, the African American population today in the United States is pretty well balanced between the North and the South. Where there had been the vast majority of African Americans living in the South before the Civil War, with four million of them being in a state of slavery before the Civil War, by the late 20th century, really about 50% of blacks live in the South and about 50% live in the North. During the 1920s, African Americans experienced what is often called the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was kind of a rebirth of African American poetry and writing and music and dance and styles. And what we see is a new pride in being black, not so much a uh, uh, almost a slavish subservience to white culture, but rather a, pli a pride in black culture. Indeed, in the 1920s, a pivotal book that was published by Alan Locke was entitled The New Negro, an Interpretation, in 1925. And so the New Negro didn't hold his head down low or be subservient to whites, but was rather proud of his culture and where he was going in life. A key leader in the Harlem Renaissance was Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey actually encourage pride in African culture and pride in African roots for many African Americans. Indeed, he actually encouraged some African Americans to flee racial injustice and to go back to Africa. Also important in particularly Harlem, but also cities like Kansas City and Chicago, was the Black is Beautiful movement. We see this particularly among African American women in which they were encouraged to be proud of black skin, black styles, and not to have just a mimicry or a poor parody of white styles, but rather to develop a unique black female African American culture. In the 1920s, however, we also see a resurgence of racial violence and racial discrimination that really becomes entrenched with the formation of the second Ku Klux Klan. The first Ku Klux Klan emerged immediately after the Civil War in southern states, particularly among Confederate veterans of the war, who would often inflict violence against local blacks and prevent blacks from voting in the South. But with the passage of the Ku Klux Klan Act and the end of Reconstruction and the securing of white political power in the South, the Ku Klux Klan pretty much dies out in the South. It's a rather weak organization by 1900. It is revitalized in the 19-teens, going uh, very strong into the 1920s, through the efforts of William Joseph Simmons, a former Methodist minister, who, at Stone Mountain, Georgia, reconstitutes the organization into what is also called, frequently called the Second Ku Klux Klan. Whereas the first Ku Klux Klan was really only directed against African Americans, former slaves, and preventing them from voting, the second Ku Klux Klan is not only an organization that certainly is directed against African Americans, preventing them from vote, maintaining segregated society, and a miscegenation or mixing of the races, but it's also an anti-immigrant, anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic organization as well. In many ways, the second Ku Klux Klan becomes much more broad in the 1920s. It's reacting not only against the new immigration that characterized the Gilded Age, but also against Jews and African Americans in the South. Indeed, the numbers become enormously strong in the 1920s. The Ku Klux Klan had never been so strong as it was in the 1920s. As you can see, this very large parade occurring down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1925, with really uh, several million Americans joining the Ku Klux Klan, not just in the South, but also in the Midwest, extending to the Plain States and even out West. During World War II, African Americans served nobly and courageously in segregated units during World War II. Often, they did not serve in combat units, although towards the end of the war they did. Often they served as cooks or stevedores, truck drivers, and also grave diggers. 
But after performing well during World War II, also in going overseas, again, African Americans anticipate when they return from the war that they will be able to secure the same freedoms and liberties and the right to vote that they had been fighting for overseas for Europeans. Indeed, a Pittsburgh black newspaper introduces and advertises what is called the Double V Campaign, Double Victory. Victory overseas over the Nazis and Imperial Japan, and also victory at home for African Americans securing those rights and liberties that they are so interested in securing. One step that is taken in the direction towards desegregation is by President Harry Truman with Executive Order 9981, issued in 1948. It wiped out segregation in the armed forces. And so for the first time, you would not have segregated black units and white units, but rather white soldiers and white sailors would serve together, bunk together, be in the same foxholes together, which would come to characterize not only military units in the Korean War, but also during the war in Vietnam. A major piece of civil rights legislation is signed by President Eisenhower in 1957. This was the first civil rights act since the Reconstruction period. Now, it was proposed and advocated and eventually signed by President Eisenhower. But the bill that eventually is signed is a watered-down version from what President Eisenhower actually wanted. Indeed, to get the bill passed through the Senate of the United States, which had many Southern segregationists in the Senate, it took a watered-down version of the bill to actually be secured. The bill that finally is signed established a Civil Rights Commission. It also established a Civil Rights Division in the Justice Department to investigate civil rights violations across the country, often going behind the back or going around state courts or local juries that would, of course, consistently fail to prosecute those who had denied blacks the right to vote or had perpetrated violence against them. Civil Rights Act of 1957 also banned voting intimidation, coercion, or interference, although those things often still continue, particularly in southern states. The major Supreme Court decision that really begins to launch the civil rights movement into the 1950s and 1960s is Brown v. Board of Education. In this case, the school board of Topeka, Kansas, was sued over the issue of segregated schools. And it is the Supreme Court presided over by President Eisenhower's Chief Justice appointee, Earl Warren, and the other members of the court, decided in a unanimous 9-0 decision that Plessy v. Ferguson, decided way back in 1896, indeed is unconstitutional. In fact, the famous phrase from Plessy v. Ferguson of separate but equal is now turned on its head, and the Warren Court issuing the majority of opinion declares that separate but equal is inherently unequal. In other words, the legalese, the term of separate but equal, is never possible, should never have been decided by the Supreme Court, is impossible to have separate but equal. So with this monumental decision, very quickly, the Supreme Court bans segregated schools and ends uh, well over 100 years of the process of providing segregated education. Now, the Brown versus Board of Education obviously is not met with much enthusiasm, particularly in the South. The governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, decides that he will defy the court and he will not support the Brown v. Board of Education decision. The NAACP is interested in challenging this uh, segregated policy, particularly in Arkansas. And so it is a courageous group of nine high school students, nine African-American high school students, who decide that they will want to attend Central High School, the main white high school in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so with the support uh, the local president of the NAACP, the Little Rock Nine apply to Central High and intend to go to school. But on the day that they intend to school, they are met by a very large mob featuring Confederate flags and yelling 
racial slogans against the Little Rock Nine, and even the governor, Orville Faubus, is there at the steps of the high school, standing with the crowd and the other white citizens of Arkansas, barring the Little Rock Nine students from coming to school. Now, President Eisenhower is rather upset by the governor's actions, and he summons him while the president is on vacation in Newport, Rhode Island, and sits down and talks with Faubus. And after they talk, the president really leans on Faubus and encourages him to admit the black students to Central High School. Faubus seems to agree with President Eisenhower and give tacit approval. But once Faubus returns to Little Rock, once again, he actually uses the State National Guard to prevent black students from going to the high school. So this is in direct violation with his agreement with President Eisenhower and even more significantly constitutionally, it is in defiance of the decision of the United States Supreme Court. Still outside of Central High School, there are large white crowds that are blocking the Little Rock Nine from going to school. So with the defiance of the governor and the crowds in Little Rock, Arkansas, President Eisenhower takes the extraordinary step of federalizing the Arkansas State National Guard, puts them into the military, and dispatches the 101st Airborne to go to Little Rock, Arkansas, complete with rifles, and bayonets, and full uniforms, and helmets, to personally escort the Little Rock Nine students to go to high school for several weeks. This was an extraordinary moment, for it was the first time that a president had so demonstrably intervened on behalf of a federal court order in order to get black students integrated with white students. It takes weeks for the acclimation and the uh, desegregation to occur, but eventually the 101st Airborne is able to withdraw and the Little Rock Nine students in, uh, encourage and inspire other local African-American uh, residents of Arkansas to also attend white schools. We also see movement towards racial integration at the university level of the University of Mississippi. James Meredith applied to the University of Mississippi and initially was denied the right to attend Ole Miss. And so eventually federal marshals were dispatched by the Kennedy administration to escort James Meredith to class. Upon entering the university, large groups of students uh, approach Meredith and are throwing rocks at federal troops and fireworks. Several students actually die in the melee. Shots are fired and becomes known as the Ole Miss Riot. But reluctantly and eventually, the University of Mississippi is integrated, now accepting black students. Another flashpoint of conflict for the integration of schools also occurred in Alabama. There, the very charismatic and vocal George Wallace was the governor of Alabama for several different terms. George Wallace becomes the face of opposition to racial integration in the South in the early 1960s. Indeed, famously, he stood before large crowds in Alabama declaring, I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever becomes one of the most famous slogans of opposition towards black civil rights and black integration of schools. But eventually, even Wallace himself is forced to submit to the power of the federal government, President Lyndon Johnson, who dispatches federal marshals and U.S. attorneys to the University of Alabama. And even though Wallace has his moment of drama in defying the federal court order, eventually he does step aside the schoolhouse and allow black students to be admitted to the University of Alabama. George Wallace will go on to run for president and become the uh, strong voice of opposition towards black integration. Although towards the end of his life, after surviving an assassination attempt and being confined to a wheelchair, George Wallace will actually make his peace with the black community in Alabama, although he remains a strong voice for states' rights in the state. One event that really attracted the attention of the nation in the early parts of the modern civil rights movement was the case of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old African-American male who lived in Chicago, but he came to the Mississippi Delta to visit family and friends in 1955. While he was there, 
he went into a local grocery store in Money, Mississippi. While he was in the store, some type of encounter occurred between him and the 21-year-old female white owner of the store in Carolyn Bryant. We're not exactly sure what was said or what was done, but the accusation is that it, in some way Emmett Till said something to Carolyn Bryant, perhaps whistled to her or propositioned her in something of a more sexual phrase. But whatever happened, the incident passed by in the grocery store, and then later Carolyn Bryant told her husband what had happened. The store still exists in Money, Mississippi today, although in a very dilapidated condition. As a result of whatever exchange occurred between Emmett Till and Carolyn Bryant in the store, Carolyn Bryant's husband was outraged and gathered some other white neighbors and tracked down where Emmett Till was staying that summer in Money, Mississippi, kidnapped him, and then brutally beat Emmett Till to death, hanged him, and then threw his body into the local Tallahatchie River. His body was later discovered to be mutilated and pulled from the river three days later. Needless to say, his mother was completely overcome with grief upon the death of her son, but her, his mother does something very unique for the time. Despite the mutilated, horrific condition of her son's body, Emmett Till's body, his mother demands that the funeral back in Chicago is conducted with an open casket so that newspapermen, photographers could take pictures and the world could see exactly what had happened to her son in Money, Mississippi. So as a result, these horrific photographs of Emmett Till's mangled body make it into national newspapers and magazines and for the first time really highlighted the violence that was occurring against African Americans in the South. What made the Emmett Till case even more ironic or perhaps bitter or egregious is the fact that just one year later, Carolyn Bryant's husband and one of the other perpetrators of Emmett Till's murder actually brag about the murder of Emmett Till to Look Magazine, which was a national publication. They are actually feel comfortable enough that they are able to do this because they would not be prosecuted in Mississippi and certainly not convicted in Mississippi by an all-white jury for an assault or murder of a young African-American male. And so as a result, the Emmett Till case actually captures the attention of the nation for the first time and highlights the violence of, against African Americans in the South. The other early notable event that really launches the modern civil rights movement was the case of Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was a dress manufacturer, a seamstress, in Montgomery, Alabama. And every day she would ride the bus to her place of work and then ride the bus home. And as often occurs in the segregated South, the buses were segregated, which required, the bus companies required for African Americans to sit in the rear of the bus and only white passengers could sit at the front of the bus. That all changes with the actions of Rosa Parks in 1955. In that year, one August day, she got on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and after being tired from working all day, she refuses to give up her seat to white passengers. She remains at the front of the bus. This is actually the very bus which Rosa Parks um, committed her famous act. It is now at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. And Rosa Parks refused to remove to the back of the bus. As a result, the bus pulls over and Rosa Parks is arrested for failing to comply with the local segregation ordinance. This is her booking photo on December 1st, 1955. The case of Rosa Parks and her civil resistance against the segregated South leads to the famous Montgomery bus boycott in which African-American civil rights leaders call on African-American citizens of Montgomery, Alabama and riders of the bus to not ride the bus, to boycott any of the segregated bus services in the city of Montgomery. Seeing how most of the customers, passengers, of the Montgomery Public Bus Service were African Americans, this would put economic uh, 
severe financial pressure on the bus companies to give up on their segregated policies. It is a long bus boycott that will last well over a year, and eventually the case makes it all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court rules, indeed, that it is a violation of the constitutional rights of the residents of Alabama, black um, African-American residents, uh, that they would be required to sit in segregated seats. They therefore win the case, and this is a major early victory for the civil rights movement and shows, demonstrably, the effectiveness of nonviolent civil resistance. The Montgomery bus boycott will lead to other boycotts throughout the segregated South and also inspire other nonviolent leadership moves. The most important leadership organization in the early civil rights movement, particularly in the South, was the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Southern Christian Leadership Conference was composed mostly of black ministers and pastors and community leaders. They came together and used particularly the influence of their pulpits and their leadership posts to organize African-American residents of the South to protest segregation policies and to launch, launch additional boycotts and call for racial justice and also the registering of African-Americans in the South and be, them be granted the right to vote. The leaders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference are here meeting at the White House with President Eisenhower. The very charismatic and young leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is Martin Luther King Jr. He becomes the definitive leader of the early civil rights movement before it fragments into various directions. And of course, he's become one of the most important African-American leaders in American history. Martin Luther King was born in 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia, in this house. He was not only the son, but also the grandson of a Baptist preacher. His father, Michael King Sr., had traveled extensively across Europe and had included going to important Protestant Reformation sites in Germany, including Wittenberg, and was so inspired by the story of Martin Luther King, he actually changes his name from Michael to Martin and also changes the name of his son. So there, thus he is Martin Luther King Sr. and Martin Luther King Jr. Now Martin Luther King Sr. was very much an old-time gospel Baptist preacher. His son is going to move in a much more social gospel direction, believing that the primary message of Jesus in the Gospels is for social justice and to establish the kingdom of God on earth, bring kingdom of realities onto earth, rather than simply a message of evangelism and soul winning. Martin Luther King, of course, grows up in the segregated South. He is going to earn at 17 his bachelor's in sociology in 1948 from Morehouse College, also the school where his father had attended. And then he will go to the desegregated seminary of Crozier Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. Thereafter, he received a scholarship to conduct PhD studies, work on his Doctor of Divinity at Boston University. He would write a dissertation there entitled The Comparison of the Conceptions of God in the Thinking of Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson. His dissertation will attract additional attention in the early 1990s, when some evidence emerges that he had plagiarized portions of the dissertation. But nevertheless, Martin Luther King, the early part of his academic career, is interesting, interested in um, combining Christian theology with social justice movements. In 1953, Martin Luther King Jr. married Coretta Scott. She would bear him four children, all of them who would later play an important role in a civil rights for African Americans. Quite often, Martin Luther King's social justice work would take him away from his families, would often, which would often uh, promote stress within his marriage. Martin Luther King Jr. would be arrested numerous times. Probably the most famous episode is amidst the Birmingham campaign to protest the treatment of African Americans in Birmingham, Alabama. He was arrested in 1963 and thrown into a local jail. There is a facsimile of that jail at the National Civil Rights Museum. From his jail cell, upon being arrested upon this time, he writes his very famous letter from a Birmingham city jail. This is a rather long letter that he had written to white community leaders. And the basic tenor of the letter is that he doesn't feel that he usually needs to address his critics 
but he would take this time to address some of the concerns that are raised about the civil rights movement and particularly the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In the letter, Martin Luther King actually says that he has more disappointment with white moderates than he does actually members of the Ku Klux Klan or avowed white supremacists. He is frustrated with constantly being told that the African American community needs to wait for social justice and wait for opportunities to be able to register and actually uh, exercise their constitutional right to vote and also wait for an end to the violence and the lynching and the convict leasing system of the South. He expresses fatigue with constantly being told to wait for justice and calls upon white leaders and particularly white Christian leaders to support the growing movement for African-American civil rights. The most famous quote from a letter from a Birmingham City Jail is that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Martin Luther King's philosophy of nonviolent passive resistance was deeply inspired not only by the works of the American writer Henry David Thoreau, but also by the Indian nationalist leader Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi had used nonviolent means in order to attract attention to the Indian independence movement in the nation of India and end British rule. Martin Luther King believes the same philosophy and strategy can be used in the American South to end segregation, promote civil rights, secure the right to vote, and end violence against African Americans in the South. One of the most visible examples and demonstrations of King's nonviolent philosophy were the famous sit-ins, which occur frequently throughout the civil rights movement. Here is one of the early sit-in movements at a Woolworths drugstore, grocery store, and lunch county in Durham, North Carolina. Of course, many cities, most cities throughout the South, had Jim Crow segregated city ordinances that required blacks to sit at certain areas of a restaurant as opposed to whites. And particularly at a Woolworths lunch counter, blacks were not allowed to actually sit at the counter. And so young African-American college students would often go to these lunch counters and sit down and ask for um, a lunch, uh, ask for a meal to be organized, uh, to be ordered. And of course, usually they would not be served. And the owner of the restaurant or the chef would call the local police and then they would be arrested. The African-American uh, sit-in leaders would not violently oppose being arrested. They rather would submit to being arrested and then uh, hauled off to jail. And often the goal was to overwhelm the local infrastructure, particularly the city jails. The jails would become so full and attract national attention to the movement. There was also a very popular and powerful sit-in movement that occurred in Nashville, Tennessee. Here's one of the more famous F.W. Woolworths that occurred uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Also, a group of 20 North Carolina A uh, and T college students sat down at a lunch call, um, counter at this Woolworth as well. These sit-in movements become very frustrating for local white authorities, for police and governmental authorities. One of them, particularly, is the very famous Bull Connor. Bull Connor was the commissioner of public safety in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. And he believed that African-American civil rights leaders were simply out to get a lot of attention on their own and um, should not be covered by the media and was really willing to use strong arm tactics against civil rights leaders to lock them up in jails or more violently used to use attack dogs or even high pressure water hoses to drive protesters and marchers and those assembling and holding placards and signs and so forth from the positions that they were at. These are horrifying scenes that attract the attention of national news media and is actually making the evening news. And Americans across the country start to realize exactly what is going on in the segregated South. And therefore, it fuels the movement and gains more attraction for the movement. Another aspect or arena in which African-American college students were involved were the famous Freedom Rides. Freedom Riders were generally college students or young African-Americans from the North that would ride Greyhound buses into the South 
to join marches or to encourage the registration of African Americans to vote in the South. They would travel uh, from northern cities, uh, such as this group from Albany, New York, and then descend on the South, not exclusively African Americans, sometimes whites, also Jewish community leaders, sometimes some Native Americans as well. Often when they arrived at bus terminals in the South, they could be greeted by angry white mobs, perhaps some uh, members of the local white citizens council or even KKK members who would assault the Freedom Riders and beat them up. The most egregious example of violence against the Freedom Riders takes place outside of Anniston, Alabama on May 14, 1961, in which this bus filled with Freedom Riders was firebombed. Uh, this famous picture really highlighted the dangerous nature of riding into the South and promoting civil rights for African Americans. Our even more violent and tragic episode occurred in September of 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama with the famous 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. It was at this church on a Sunday morning, a, a historically black church in Birmingham, Alabama, in which a group of children were getting ready for the church service, for morning worship, they had just been finishing up Sunday school and they were in the restroom changing into their choir robes. And when local members of the KKK threw 19 sticks of dynamite into one of the basement windows, there was a horrific explosion that broke almost every window in the church and blasted out the basement of the building. Immediately, four African-American young girls were killed in the blast of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. This horror really attracts the attention of the nation, and they start to realize, many Americans around the nation start to realize that indeed the American South has become a war zone, with African Americans often fighting for their very lives. And what exact country are we living in? The fact that young girls who are getting ready for a church service are killed by this type of violence. A growing movement of various civil rights organizations came together in August of 1963 to organize the famous March on Washington. This was not only a march to highlight the civil rights movement and to promote the end of segregation and also to get blacks registered in the vote, but also to promote economic opportunities, particularly jobs. An estimated crowd of 250,000 marchers participated. 80% of them were black marchers that descend on the Washington Mall, surround the reflecting pond in the shadow of the Washington Monument and also the Lincoln Memorial. Many speakers spoke before the marchers of the March on Washington, but the most famous one, of course, was the last speaker, who was Martin Luther King, who delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. The last portion of the speech, which is possible that he delivered uh, with improvisation, is I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. The March of Washington really solidifies Martin Luther King's leadership of the nonviolent passive resistance portion of the civil rights movement and uh, adds additional energy to the movement. But the violence continued in the segregated South, with one of its more famous victims being Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers was a family man who lived in Mississippi and uh, had worked for the local Mississippi chapter of the NAACP and had also been advocating for the rights of African Americans in Mississippi to exercise their right to vote. And as a result of his efforts, one night when he returned to his home, he was shot in his driveway in front of his family. The Medgar Edwards case also attracts national attention to what exactly was going in the South as did the famous murder of three civil rights workers in Philadelphia, Mississippi, sometimes called the Mississippi Burning Case, as a famous movie was made about this case in the 1980s. The Mississippi Civil Rights Workers' Murders, 
involved three young civil rights workers. Michael, nicknamed Mickey Schwermer, James Cheney, who was African American, and Andrew Goodman. They had come to Mississippi in order to be a part of Freedom Summer, in which was an effort to break down the local infrastructure and to get African Americans registered to vote. As they are traveling throughout the Mississippi Delta, they, after they have these rallies to register African Americans to vote, frequently churches are burned by local Klansmen and white citizens councils where these things had occurred. And indeed, here are the ruins of the Mount Zion Methodist Church in Longdale, Mississippi, where these three civil rights workers had spoken on Memorial Day. While passing through Philadelphia, Mississippi, they had been arrested and detained by the local sheriff and his deputy in the Neshoba County Jailhouse. While they were there, there was enough time for the local sheriff and his deputy to contact local members of the Ku Klux Klan, including many of the local residents uh, in this picture. Eventually, once the word had gone out that these three civil rights workers were in Philadelphia, they were released to their car and told not to come back to Philadelphia. They would proceeded down County Road 515, nicknamed Rock Cut Road. After driving a few miles out of town from Philadelphia, Mississippi, they are soon pulled over by another patrol car as well as a local pickup truck. They are told to pull off to the side of the road and then proceed up this dark corner of this remote, obscure dirt road. There, all three of them are shot and murdered in their vehicle. The bodies are loaded into one of the cars and then never seen uh, again or heard of in the local area. Later on, it's revealed that the deputy sheriff, Cecil Ray Price, was actually involved in the murders, and he is quoted as saying, Well, boys, you've done a good job. You've struck a blow for the white man. Mississippi can be proud of you. You've let those agitating outsiders know where this state stands. Go home now and forget it, but before you go, I'm looking each one of you in the eye and telling you this. The first man who talks is dead. If anybody who knows anything about this ever opens his mouth to any outsider about it, then the rest of us are going to kill him just as dead as we killed those three sons of bitches tonight. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The man who talks is dead, dead, dead. So there is an organized effort by the local law enforcement and the local Ku Klux Klan to make sure that these murders are not revealed. And rather, the local law enforcement promote the myth that the three civil rights workers had simply driven back up north. Very quickly, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference reveals that these three civil rights workers are missing. Wanted uh, missing persons reports are put out across the country, and eventually the FBI is called in. There's no evidence that Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner had ever left Philadelphia, Mississippi. So dozens and then hundreds of FBI agents descend onto Philadelphia, Mississippi. Many of them stay at this hotel, which remains standing today looking for evidence and trying to talk to local residents or anybody who might know something about the missing civil rights workers. Indeed, they canvass the area, hundreds of agents and also Naval Reserve officers trying to find anything. Eventually, they get in touch with some local Choctaw Indians who alert them that indeed a car had been abandoned a few weeks before in a local swamp. That car is removed and pulled out of the swamp, and authorities and FBI investigators, forensic experts, declared that the car had been burned and torched before it actually had been dumped in the swamp. Because the torch car was found without bodies inside of it, the search goes on by the FBI trying to find still the remains of the civil rights workers. Clearly, violence has occurred here, and clearly someone has murdered the civil rights workers, and the charge now is to find their bodies and proceed with the investigation. But it's very difficult for the FBI to find local residents who are willing to talk. The Ku Klux Klan and White Citizens Council has exercised a lot of threat and violence and fear, instilled a lot of fear in local residents, not only among white but also black residents. And so even those who might have seen something and known something about the case 
were reluctant to talk to the FBI. Eventually, in one of the best pieces of investigation the FBI had ever done, they are actually able to flip one of the local Klansmen who, under the promise of immunity, is able to reveal numerous details of exactly what had taken place. And so the FBI is given a tip to proceed to a local farm and this local levee that was being built on this farm and buried about 15 feet down into the levee after be giving a tip they find the remains of the three bodies of Cheney, Schwarmer, and Goodman on August 4th, 1964. And then the bodies are provided to the local coroners and then the local families are notified. As a result of having this tip of the source within the Klan itself, the FBI is able, through the Justice Department, to file charges against local law enforcement officials including the sheriff and the deputy and local members that had been involved in the Ku Klux Klan. Now, the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department cannot file murder charges against those who had perpetrated these murders because murder is a state charge. But because of the 1957 Civil Rights Act, there, is this, there are federal civil rights violations that could be filed against these perpetrators. Unfortunately, many of them are exonerated and many of them are not convicted. Even those who are, were involved in the murders and convicted only serve very short prison times. Many of them will be released very quickly and spend the rest of their life in Neshoba County, Mississippi, where they will remain in the local phone book and even die peacefully in their beds. The only exception is Edgar Ray Killen, who is nicknamed the Preacher, who had also been a member of the Klan, and he had also been in involved in the murders of the three civil rights workers. It is not until 2005, when Edgar Ray Killen is actually a very old man, that he is prosecuted and convicted for being involved in the murder of Cheney Schwarmer and the other civil rights workers. This is Dr. Carolyn Goodman, who was Andrew Goodman's mother, who also testified uh, the pain and injury that the murder of her son way back in 1964 had caused her throughout her life. The murder and the violence and the continuous segregation that continues to make the evening news really makes civil rights a national issue. And Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders continued to meet with President Lyndon Johnson, seeking for him to provide leadership and oversee the passage in Congress of a new, stronger Civil Rights Act. Finally, that act is achieved over the objections and nay votes of numerous Southern Senators with the passage of the very monumental Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the first major, very powerful piece of legislation since the Reconstruction period. It outlawed, outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It prohibited unequal application of voter, voter registration requirements. That means getting rid of literacy tests and also um, the various intimidation techniques that were used to prevent blacks from voting. It also abolished racial segregation in schools, employment, and public accommodations. With a stroke of the pen, President Johnson, by signing the Civil Rights Act passed by Congress, ends Jim Crow South legalized segregation becomes unconstitutional. Now, despite the Civil Rights Act and despite the prohibition against preventing people from voting in the South, there are still loopholes in the law that Southern political leaders took advantage of to deny African Americans the right to vote. These events come to a head even more notably on the evening news with the famous Bloody Sunday events of March 7, 1965. Civil rights leaders, including John L. Lewis from Georgia, had organized a march to proceed from a church in Selma, Alabama, all the way to Montgomery that would attract national attention for the need for African Americans to have the right to vote and be secured. Shortly after leaving the church in Selma, the march would proceed over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, this famous bridge. As the marchers proceeded over the bridge, they are met 
with members of the Alabama Highway Patrol and local police force. And because this assembly is ruled to be an illegal assembly, an illegal march, the Highway Patrol produces guard dogs and nightsticks and starts attacking the marchers, beating them, drawing blood, and pushing them back to head back over the bridge so that they cannot continue with the march. So young men, old men, young women, and uh, older women are all attacked by highway patrol officers in a rather really bloody scene that attracts national attention. As a result of the events of Bloody Sunday, just a few weeks later, Martin Luther King arrives in Selma and leads thousands upon more demonstrators, this time successfully after receiving permission from the city to march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and to proceed on a multi-day march all the way from Selma to Montgomery to highlight the need for voting rights for African Americans. Those rights are finally secured with the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and signed by President Lyndon Johnson. The Voting Rights Act provided nationwide protection for voting rights. It prohibited any state from passing voting discrimination laws. It also outlawed the very controversial and prohibitive literacy tests that African Americans had been subjected to to prevent them to have the right to vote. Also, part of the Voting Rights Act was the preclearance requirement that prevented states from changing their voting laws without the Attorney General's approval. This introduced a measure of oversight over states that would make sure that the federal government would prevent any state from denying African Americans the right to vote. Also part of the federal, the Civil Rights, or the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was the famous coverage formula which monitored various localities even closer, particularly in the South, if they were discriminating against local uh, residents and prohibiting them of the right Another piece of important legislation regarding the Civil Rights Movement was the Fair Housing Act of 1968. This act of Congress that was also signed by President Johnson banned discrimination in the sale or rental of a property based on race, creed, religion, or national origin. This was an important piece of legislation for particularly African Americans who lived in urban areas and often encountered discrimination as they endeavored to rent a place to live. There were many other important civil rights leaders during the movement. John Lewis was a civil rights leader and chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He helped to organize the March on Washington in 1963 and also participated in the Selma to Montgomery March, which resulted in his being attacked on Bloody Sunday. Lewis went on to serve as a congressman from Georgia from 1987 until his death in 2020. Andrew Young also lived extensively in Georgia and was part of the executive committee of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and a close friend and confidant of Martin Luther King Jr. Young would go on to become a congressman from Georgia as well, an ambassador to the United Nations, and mayor of Atlanta from 1982 to 1990. Roger Wilkins served as the director of the Federal Community Relations Service during the Johnson administration and advised the president on civil rights issues. Wilkins also served as an assistant attorney general in the Justice Department. Bob Moses served as the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and also worked to register African American voters during Mississippi's Freedom Summer. Julian Bond helped establish the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee as well as the Southern Poverty Law Center. He also served as the director of the NAACP from 1998 to 2010. Ralph Abernathy was a close friend and confidant of Martin Luther King, who helped organize the Montgomery Bus Boycott and was a founding member of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Bobby Seale was a founding member of the Black Panther Party and campaigned against police violence against blacks, particularly in Oakland, California. Huey Newton also was a founding member of the Black Panther Party. In many ways, by the mid-1960s, the civil rights movement starts to fracture or starts to separate and go in different directions, whereas Martin Luther King Jr. emphasized civil resistance, nonviolent, passive resistance against segregated institutions, using the power of assembly and peaceful protest 
to raise awareness regarding disenfranchisement of African Americans from the vote in the South and also discrimination in a lot of areas of the economy and also housing. Latter civil rights leaders started to move in a much more aggressive movement, a much more violent movement, and did not necessarily believe in the possibility of the integration of the races. These later civil rights movements start to emphasize black distinctions, black power, black culture, and even assert the superiority of black men and women against those of whites. And because of the long history of discrimination and racial violence, really begin to reject the idea that blacks and whites will ever live in peace together. A good example of that is the black power movement. This movement celebrated black cultural contributions and assertion of black culture over that of white culture. Black power activists founded black-owned bookstores, food cooperatives, farms, media, printing presses, schools, clinics, and even local ambulance services for blacks that they believe would better take care of their local African-American populations. Important leader in the early founding of the black power movement was Stokely Carmichael. He was one of the original freedom writers, but gradually became disillusioned with the nonviolent approach of the civil rights movement, and he participated in the founding of the Black Panthers, and particularly the Black Power movement. He was a strong supporter of the Pan-African movement, and eventually moved to Ghana and Guinea in Africa, and abandoned the United States. Indeed, in the decades to come, many Black leaders and cultural figures will abandon the United States, no longer believing it is possible for the races to live together and will relocate to a country in Africa. Probably the most significant individual and name connected towards this new movement in the civil rights movement towards rejection of integration of the races and the superiority of blacks uh, over whites is that of Malcolm X. Malcolm X was an African-American Muslim minister and a vocal spokesman for the Nation of Islam. He was born Malcolm Little in 1925, but he later, call, later ch called his last name his slave name, that of Little, and not truly reflective of him as a black man. He therefore adopted the name Malcolm X with the X to represent his lost and unknown African sl slave name. Malcolm X re represented a significant departure from the integrationist nonviolent movement of Martin Luther King. Malcolm X emphasized the inability of whites and blacks to share the nation and to live together, and rather believed in the separation of the races, and the, particularly the superiority of the black man over the white man. Malcolm X's father died when he was just a boy. His mother subsequently had a history of mental illness and indeed was hospitalized uh, for much of the remainder of her life. Malcolm X uh, was continually in and out of trouble with the law as a boy and as a young man. He served 10 years in prison for larceny and breaking and entering. This is his booking photo in 1944. While in prison, he was exposed to the teachings of Islam and converted to Islam, becoming a Muslim. Malcolm X's exposure to Islam really began with the traditional black organization called the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam particularly worked within prisons to draw black convicts into the movement and to convert to Islam. So from his adoption of Islam and entrance into the Nation of Islam in 1952, he was its most vocal spokesman until he broke with the organization in 1964. Malcolm X was a very powerful speaker, and he continued to promote the teachings of the Nation of Islam, which included the ideas that black people are the original people of the world, not white people, and that white people are devils, that blacks are superior to whites, and that the demise of the white race is imminent, leading to the superiority of the black race. This is certainly uh, very much a departure from the original civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King. It's a significant departure 
from that integrationist nonviolent movement that Martin Luther King advocated. Malcolm X preferred to emphasize the inability of blacks and whites to really live together. And indeed, there was only one time in which Malcolm X and Martin Luther King actually met uh, here during the Senate debates regarding the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But in the end, Malcolm X really represents a movement for black rights that is much more consistent with that of W.B.B. Du Bois that demanded civil rights immediately, but also at the same time acknowledging that a national government that is really led by whites really cannot give blacks anything. Blacks have to seize what they need immediately and assert their superiority over the whites. And if that, if that requires violence, so be it. Much of Malcolm X's message is drowned out by the fact that he is not the leader, but he is the spokesman for the nation of Islam. Malcolm X originally is a very devout follower of Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad was the longtime leader of the nation of Islam and advocated for the superiority and the assertion of African Americans. Indeed, no one was more devout of an adherent to Elijah, Elijah Muhammad's teachings than Malcolm X once he became a Muslim. But over time, Malcolm X grew increasingly disaffected with the leadership of the nation of Islam, and he actually begins to publicly criticize Elijah Muhammad, particularly as it is revealed to Malcolm X as he discovers that Elijah Muhammad is having numerous extramarital affairs and engaging in extensive womanizing, fathering numerous children outside of marriage. This was against the strict rules of the nation of Islam. Indeed, this is a crisis of conscience for Malcolm X, because how could the very devout and esteemed leader of the nation of Islam that prohibited these things be actually engaging in these things? Malcolm X believed this was an example of just rank hypocrisy and really compromised the teachings of Elijah Muhammad and the movement of the nation of Islam. So therefore, after Malcolm X participates in the Hajj, which is the required pilgrimage of Muslims to Mecca, Malcolm X evolves in his Muslim faith and starts to embrace Sunni Islam and part of the broader civil rights movement, and he changes his name to El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. After a brief period of travel across Africa, he publicly renounces the nation of Islam and instead founds his own black Muslim organizations, including the Islamic Muslim Mosque Incorporated and the Pan-African Organization of African American Unity. Malcolm X's very public quarrel with the Nation of Islam led to several death threats to be issued against him. This famous photo was printed in the black magazine Ebony, portraying Malcolm armed and protecting his family against would-be assassins dispatched by the Nation of Islam. However, on February 21, 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated at the Audubon Ballroom in New York City. He had arrived at this location to make a speech, and suddenly three gunmen jumped up from the crowd, approached the stage with sawed-off shotguns, and fired 21 shots into Malcolm X, killing him instantly. Three Nation of Islam members were subsequently charged with the murder and given indeterminate life sentences. Publicly, Elijah Muhammad denied that the Nation of Islam was involved in Malcolm's murder, but he also declared Malcolm X had brought it on himself. Malcolm X, although never part of the Black Panther Party, certainly his ideas and his teachings are much more consistent with the teachings of the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party, which was originally the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, was a black power organization founded by black college students Bobby Seale and Huey Newton in October 1966 in Oakland, California. The party was active in the United States between 1966 to 1982 with chapters in numerous major cities and international chapters in Britain and Algeria. Upon its inception, the Black Panthers Party's core practice was its open carry armed citizens patrol, in other words, cop watching, in which armed blacks would patrol America's cities to protect blacks from white cops, 
and their purpose was to monitor the behavior of officers, particularly in the Oakland Police Department, and challenge police brutality wherever they deemed it to exist. Indeed, as we proceed to the mid-60s and to the late 60s, America's cities are just rife with violence, much of it often instigated as a form of racial conflict. A good example of that is the Watts riot in April 1965. Watts was a very poor black neighborhood in Los Angeles. On August 11, 1965, Marquette Fry, a 21-year-old African-American man, was pulled from his vehicle after failing a sobriety test. Officers attempted to arrest him. Marquette resisted arrest with assistance from his mother, and a physical confrontation ensued in which Marquette was struck in the face with a baton. Meanwhile, a crowd of onlookers had gathered. Distorted rumors spread that the police had kicked a pregnant woman who was present at the scene. Six days of civil unrest followed, motivated in part by allegations of police abuse. The Watts riot to see some rather bloody and violent images broadcasted on American television sets at night as Los Angeles police and California Highway Patrol engage in violence with local residents in an effort to subdue the riot. Nearly 14,000 members of the California Army National Guard were called in to help suppress the disturbance and end the riots. The result was 34 deaths and $40 million in property damage. Many cities, particularly in 1967, saw a lot of racial violence that led to burnings and fires and conflict between police and even pitch battles in major American cities. 1967 is often known as the Long Hot Summer, particularly because of the abundance of conflicts and fires and racial violence in America's cities. The Long Hot Summer of 1967 witnessed 159 race riots erupting across the United States. In June, there were riots in Atlanta, Boston, Cincinnati, Buffalo, and Tampa. In July, there were riots in Detroit, Birmingham, Chicago, New York City, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, New Britain, Rochester, Plainfield, and Toledo. The most destructive riots of the summer took place in July in Newark, New Jersey, and Detroit, Michigan. And indeed, these cities of Newark and Detroit will almost become synonymous for poverty, racial conflict, violence, and street fights. In Detroit, violence, rioting, and armed conflict broke out between black residents and the Detroit Police Department. As a result of the riots in Detroit alone, 43 citizens were dead, 1,189 were injured, and there were over 7,200 arrests and more than 2,000 buildings destroyed. If there is a symbol of how the latter civil rights movement descends into violence and in some ways figuratively assassinates or kills the early civil rights movement of nonviolent passive resistance, that symbol probably could be found in the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th, 1968. Martin Luther King had come to Memphis, Tennessee to assist some black garbage workers in their strike, looking for higher wages, fewer hours, and better conditions. He had made a speech the night before called, I may not make it to the mountaintop, but he had inspired his congregation and his listeners to continue this protest in Memphis and to continue the civil rights movement, even if he was no longer present. James Earl Ray was a small-time criminal who had committed numerous crimes. This is burglary and larson and breaking and entry and forgery and check fraud. He had been sentenced to 20 years in prison in 1967 for a multitude of crimes. But he had managed to escape from the Missouri State Penitentiary in 1967 in a bread truck that had pulled up to the prison bakery. Subsequently, Ray fled to Mexico, where he aspired to work as a pornographic film director with prostitutes he had met in Mexico. Feeling rejected by one of those prostitutes he had met in Mexico, Ray returned to the United States, bouncing from city to city. He became attracted to the 1968 presidential campaign of George Wallace, as Ray was a racist and strongly supported segregationist policies. He began tracking Martin Luther King, and increasingly became enraged and saw King 
as the symbol of all of America's racial problems and urban violence. As Ray tracked Martin Luther King all the way to Memphis, he learned that he was staying at the Lorraine Motel, and Ray set up a firing position opposite of the motel where, where King was staying. King had gone out to the balcony and was standing near his room when suddenly he was shot with a single .30-06 bullet fired from a Remington Model 760 rifle. The bullet entered through King's right cheek, breaking his jaw and several vertebrae as it traveled down his spinal cord, severing his jugular vein and major arteries in the process before lodging in his shoulder. The force of the shot ripped King's necktie off. King fell backward onto the balcony, unconscious. Those who were with him realized where the shot had come from and started pointing in that direction. James Earl Ray avoided capture and escaped to the United Kingdom, where he hoped to move on to the segregated African nation of Rhodesia. He was arrested at London's Heathrow Airport for presenting a false passport. He was charged with King's murder and pled guilty. He was sentenced to 99 years of prison, of which he served 29 years until his death in 1998. Across America's cities, there were large gatherings commemorating the life of Martin Luther King. The largest was in the city of Atlanta, where the actual funeral took place at the Ebenezer Street Baptist Church, where his father had been a minister, as had Martin Luther King. President Johnson declared April 7th a national day of mourning in the wake of King's death, and after 100,000 mourners viewed King's funeral procession in Atlanta, Eventually, Martin Luther King was laid to rest right near the Ebenezer Street Baptist Church, as well as the King Museum and Center. Across America, additional riots broke out in approximately 60 U.S. cities following King's assassination. One exception to that was in the city of Indianapolis. Robert F. Kennedy was campaigning for president in 1968. And it is he who heard of the assassination of Martin Luther King, and he notified his listeners, this crowd, immediately calmed down the crowd. And as a result, Indianapolis is an exception in that the black neighborhoods of Indianapolis, probably from the calming influence of Robert F. Kennedy, did not engage in rioting and burning as a result of the assassination of Martin Luther King. Robert Kennedy, in many ways, became the symbol of hope for black audiences and black voters for the continuation of the civil rights movement to a national level. And many hopes were pinned on Robert F. Kennedy that if he was elected president and was the leader of the national government, that he would continue legislatively from the national level the civil rights movement with additional pieces of legislation. And indeed, as the Johnson administration becomes increasingly unpopular because of America's descent into Vietnam and also racial conflict in the cities, Robert F. Kennedy's campaign begins to pick up speed. And indeed, he wins unexpectedly, in a shocker, the California primary on June 5, 1968. As a result, his supporters and his campaign staff and team gather at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles that night. Famously, Robert Kennedy comes to the podium, acknowledges the victory in the California primary. It certainly seems like RFK is on his way to receiving the Democratic nomination and could quite possibly get elected that fall of 1968. He famously finishes his speech and says, and it's on to Chicago, we'll win there, waves to the crowd and walks to the back of the ballroom into the kitchen of the Ambassador Hotel, and there waiting for him was a Palestinian young man named Sirhan Sirhan. Sirhan Sirhan apparently was offended by some very pro-Israel, pro-Jewish remarks that RFK had made several days before. And so Sirhan Sirhan is waiting for RFK in the kitchen of the Ambassador Hotel, and when RFK arrives into the kitchen, he shoots RFK numerous times. This is a famous photograph of the event with Robert Kennedy mortally wounded on the floor of the kitchen, and kneeling beside him is the 17-year-old busboy, Juan Romero, who had been shaking Kennedy's hand when Sirhan Sirhan fired the shots. <laughs> 
Sarhan Sarhan will be convicted for the assassination of RFK and spend the rest of his life in prison. And so in some ways, we may date the end of the civil rights movement with two assassinations, that of Martin Luther King and that of RFK. And indeed, one way of thinking about the civil rights movement is a movement that began as a nonviolent, passive, peaceful protest a movement that emphasized civil resistance without violence actually fractures into a multitude of movements with some of the black leaders and actually emphasizing violence and the necessity of violence. And indeed, some of the greatest hopes for the continuation of the civil rights movement being victims of violence themselves. Martin Luther King's assassination and also Robert Kennedy's assassination, both in the early part of 1968. So what is the legacy of the civil rights movement? We might see it as a securing of not only civil liberties, but also civil rights. By civil rights, we mean the impetus needs to be placed on the government to actively pursue securing the rights of citizens through legislation and also law enforcement. Many have viewed the civil rights movement as the capstone or a finishing of what the founding fathers had envisioned in the United States Constitution, whereas independence had been secured for white Americans in 1776, now independence is being secured for black Americans in the 1950s and 1960s. And whereas many civil liberties were promised in the United States Constitution at the nation's founding, now they're actually being secured and enjoyed by African Americans in the 1950s and 1960s. We can also view the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century is also completing reconstruction. What reconstruction begins in the emancipation of the slaves and defining citizenship and also promising the right to vote, those constitutional rights are actually secured finally during the civil rights movement. And then many would also argue that the civil rights movement does not end, but rather it continues today and that there are still issues of discrimination and racism in American society that need to be addressed through legislation and additional marches and protests. Needless to say, the civil rights movement is definitely one of the most significant movements in American history, but it is variously interpreted and there's much debate exactly when it began, when it ended, and what is its legacy for today.